Hello, everyone, to another episode of MCL Talks, brought to you by the Manila Composers Lab. MCL Talks features a series of online discussions and reflections revolving around composition as creative process. And of course, the founders of the lab form part of today's panel. So I am Juro Kim Feliz, a composer based in Toronto and a graduate of McGill University in Montreal. And joining me here is composer Jonas Baez of the University of the Philippines College of Music, and who's also the executive director of MCL. Composer and conductor Alexander John Villanueva, also from the University of the Philippines. Soprano Pauline Therese Arejola. Film composer Marie-Louise Calvero of Hochschule für Musik Freiburg in Germany and Dominic Quijada from Egosoft GmbH. We are now happy to actually welcome composer Feliz Ann Makahis of Universität für Musik und Darstellende Kunst Graz in Austria. And she's gonna give us a, uh, today's featured work. Feliz previously finished studies at the University of the Philippines, the University of Memphis in the US, and the Hochschule für Musik, Theater und Medien Hanover under various mentors. She has received commissions and grants for her work from the Fondation Musica Antiqua Nova, Cosé des Arts et des Lettres de Québec, the Deutschen Opel Berlin, and the Hoyamont Foundation, along with residencies under the Künstlerhäuser Wolfswede and the Federal Chancellery and Kulturkontakt Austria. Present collaborators include Ensemble Schalfeld, Ensemble Bruch, Ensemble S201, the soprano Josefina Gürman and the accordionist Goran Stepanovich. She is currently the workshop director of the Manila Composers Lab this year and also one of the resident composers of Ensemble Linea. And there we have it. Let's have Phyllis right here on the floor. Thank you, Boggs. Thank you. Um, I, so I will talk about my piece from 2015. It's called Hibla. Um, performed by a Finnish-based ensemble. I think I will play it first so we can listen and look at the score. No?
So Hibla is a piece written for an ensemble based in Finland, dedicated to performing microtonal music. Some instruments like the guitar, accordion, and piano were particularly developed or enhanced to accommodate more precision in achieving microtones. For example, the piano has extra keys in between the usual white and black keys. And um, it was connected to two acoustic disc claviers tuned a quarter tone apart. It was in Passi Music Festival in Kopio where the instrument was first presented in public. This took place in 2015, the same year um, I was reading a lot about some writings of Henri Bagson. It's uh, Time and Free Will and Matter and Memory. And I think my perception of music and sound gradually um, shifted into something like an imaginary object, but with vivid properties suspended in time and um, in specific space. Since then, my first question, first questions in composing were not about something, um, not about how something would progress from beginning to end and how the material would develop during the process. It became something like, I have an object here. What happens if I turn it this way or this way in this phase? So my approach to Hibla was um, literally like exploring the surface of an object from different perspectives in various stretches of time. There were three frames, same opening gestures, similar attempt in adapting the vocal gesture into the other instruments, similar recurring intervals. Um, if you notice the fifths and the microtonal coloring of the pitches around. Um, but different ways on sound expansion. So the registers, the quality, basically the techniques, and um, the synchronization. I think this is not just a question of how um, one orchestrates the sound. I became more and more aware of which uh, frequencies would naturally be more resonant when you combine the sounds together. Of course, in the end, um, this is still something intuitive. Um, the color depends on, you know, our inner hearing. Yeah, now what is color or kulai when, as how we um, call it, and at least within our group, um, I think we're talking about something one cannot fully grasp or specify because perception will always be different. We can always um, approach it and talk about the combination of timbre and talk about the, um, the atmosphere, the sound event, but there are things evoked that may have been part of the composition process or may have been the trigger and the whole point of the music, which is not shared. I'm not talking about the concept of the piece. I'm talking about your small routine as a composer, your interest, maybe fantasies, um, emotions, and experiences. Um, it's something you keep to yourself. And for me, when I hear a specific uh, piece of mine, it would flash right away an image of um, a person or a place or a moment. When memory is evoked, our other senses are activated. So hearing, feeling. For example, um, I hear bells for different reasons. It reminds me of, um, of the energy of the community we created when we performed a huge spatial work at Annex Garden more than 10 years ago. It um, reminds me of the city lights of Montréal, from Mont-Royal and from Parc Jean Drapeau. Or I hear the voice and see the image of, of the person whenever I wear, for example, bells that 
I gave this person, which he transformed as a gift, like a necklace, or returned and returned it, and sent it back to me after a long time of not being in contact. Yeah, this is really a short um, thoughts on on um, color and the images evoked and how it influenced um, maybe my music. Very interesting points, probably that we can interpolate from that. Um, one, one aspect of the piece that I kind of uh, responded to at first was the very idea of gesture itself as well, where it's like you see these dissenting uh, gestures. You know, it, it actually reminded me of two things. Um, it reminded me one uh, for one. It reminded me of uh, Philippe Leroux and his piece uh, Dalé where it's like uh, he was heavily invested on uh, creating strands of these gestures of scales going up and down, you know, and all that. Uh, okay. So, so it, it, would, it was a very, I would say humoristic piece in a certain way, also just because it seems like he was actually making fun of all of these, uh, you know, classical uh, tropes and all that. Uh, but another thing that I was also reminded of <clears throat> was um, the idea of, bla um, there's this, there, there's this descending contour that, that reminded me of um, Henry Purcell, <laughs> Daido in Aeneas, when I am laid in earth, right? Where you actually see these, uh, the, the strings introduction actually pulling out a lament of some sort. <laughs> so again, mm -hmm. we go back to this, uh, the symbolism of lament and I kind of like associate that when I hear these descending uh, gestures. Um, so there's the gesture, uh, the gestural aspect that we can actually talk about. There is also um, the aspect of symbolism, where you actually uh, evoke the idea of bells. And we kind of hear your idea of color as a result, as a sensual process. So color is not just a technique. It's not just a compositional device uh, that uh, uses combinations of different timbres and all that for you it's uh it's a sensual process it's uh something that's being sensed by you know by your five senses it invokes memories it invokes uh, certain feelings even and uh, mm -hmm. specifically when you talk about bells um there are certain memories evoked in that and i think that's uh, probably one of the aspects of this composition that really like <clears throat> pushes it out in the front so i'm also getting um, another aspect of space as well here where you're talking about Henry Bergson and uh, the idea of time suspension and basically how we perceive time and how it is actually being manipulated or composed. We could actually also talk about that as well. And there's also the microtonal aspect and um, where we actually see microtonal music um, being an avenue towards like exploring space. So pitches space, um, timbre space, and the combination of voice and the instruments and the tensions actually that are being evoked here. The, the imposition of the voice, right? From high to low uh, as against the precision of quarter tones and all of those. Uh, uh, all of those implications. So those are the things that I am um, getting from this piece and we're already opening the floor for comments, thoughts, discussions. I'm, I'm very much impressed with the notion of uh, color in this piece. That was the, the thing that came to mind. I heard this sometime in 2016, I think, and when, when it was in YouTube and I was so impressed with the performance. Uh, I was looking at the phrases, uh, they, they were, uh, is there, I just wanted to ask Felicia, is there some kind of a uh, recurrence? Uh, is there some kind of a cycle? I just want to confirm if my feeling is the same. Uh, is there some kind of a cycle of colors here? We can see it in a way that it's it's recurring, but um, mm -hmm. I, during this time, I was really trying to find other means of how I would work on structure and how I would mm -hmm. build the phrases. Mm -hmm. And instead of events that are happening, like going back to the center, mm -hmm. 
it's more of it's the it's one object just presented in different angles and that way is it uh, is it uh, temporal are, are you trying to transcend the notion of of time and music music is time music is occurring in time are you trying mm -hmm. to transcend that it's, it's uh, have i talked to you before about uh, the unbearable lightness of being. Remember that old uh, that that old novel where things are recurring, and and there was this writer who, who kind of related it to Beethoven. Beethoven's, uh, I think it was a the Grosse Fuge, as mm -hmm. apparently in the same way as as as, as uh, you were dealing with an object, looking different angles, and he was talking about the occurrence of things of the same thing from different mm -hmm. perspectives and and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in that way it's it's to me that was kind of uh, anti-temporal in the sense that uh, time is not structured in such a way because whatever you perceive is also going on in some other uh, some other uh, dimension yeah mm -hmm. It's just that you cannot perceive all the dimensions together. I guess uh, yeah. I think that's that's what so, I, I am. What what I that that's how I look at this. That's why I was I was asking if it was, it was cyclic because instead of a cycle, I see actually the same thing happening, the same thing happening. But I have I tend to forget what was the what what previously happened. So what I see the same thing. Was this what I heard a while ago, or was this finished? Or it is a fascinating thing. I mean, in that sense. Yeah. So definitely, um, I think the book I was reading about um, time and free will it mm. really opened my um, my thoughts to. I, I haven't read that. What, what what is what's that? Who's the author again? Um, Henri Bergson. Bergson. Um, so. It's, it is, it's like basically describing how um, we perceive things or objects mm -hmm. and then how, how it's being, um, you know, ordered in, in our mind. So how, oh. how things are, how space is created in our perception and how our subconscious mind would, you know, put them in order. Okay. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing for me because um, it connects to to working on imagery and then mm -hmm. and reflecting on how how would I work on imagery into something tangible, something you can hear, and then how would it be um, received by the listener and remembered, so that yeah. even if you try to you know make different things of the same object they would still remember that this is the object and yeah yes i've listened to this a number of times and 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 uh, now i listen now that i listened to it today and now that you played it not being aware if this was the past or this is the present or in that sense it's several dimensions happening at the same time that uh perception of uh, time and all that. It kind of reminded me actually of Samuel Beckett and his uh, play uh, Waiting for Godot, if everyone's familiar with that. So um, it's basically just like about a series of events where someone was waiting for Godot who actually never came. And that kind of cyclical repetition of uh, these conversations kind of questions your perception of time and in exactly the same way. And I would even say that it's like you're <clears throat> challenging the notion of linearity in this sense. Uh, and you're putting discontinuity at the forefront instead. It's like uh, this, this exact conversation, did it really happen in the present or did it happen in the past? Did it happen before mm -hmm. this or that? And so it's very interesting to see um, a composition that kind of actually like, well, gives that perception and probably not in not even um, in a very explicit way, and it's just because like there are lots of symbols that you hear in certain and certain gestures in certain moments that make you uh, come up with these associations. 
Um, one thing, what does the bold triangle in page eight um, refer to be? If bar six. Oh, this triangle, the pressure of the bow. Ah, okay. It's attached to the violin, not the piano. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought it had something. It should to be above the notes. Yeah, yeah, but it yeah. it was closer cassette to the piano line, so I thought it had something to do with it. Mm. All right. Um, <laughs> just uh, an observation going from Jonas's piece and then AJ's piece and then this piece and thinking back to my work, um, it seems to apparent to me that this. Granted that it's a theme of the piece, but is the gesture with long sustained tone combinations that are stretched out and transform over time seems to be a constant? Can we call that a stylistic constant among us? Ah, oh. oh, that's a good question. And um, if it is, then is it something that we should embrace or is it something that we should break? Seeing the score, I find a lot of familiar things as well to <laughs> to <laughs> what I have seen uh, with Doctor Bai's work and some... you, you call you you call that famil familiar uh, familial gestures. That's what you call family resemblances. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's like not necessarily a bad thing. It's just yeah, a question. yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> it is interesting. Yeah, I I I, I, I would never notice that uh, Dominic. Dominic noticed it and uh, congratulations, but I would never notice it now that I realize yeah, I was, I was <laughs> Yes. Maybe it's from my yeah. long sabbatical. <laughs> um, last question for now, at least. Um, I'm trying to grasp what exactly Felice means by color. Because the way I understand it, it's a concrete property of sound. It's, um, I mean, uh, granted it, it results from a combination of timbre and harmony over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, but when you speak of color, are you talking because you 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 mentioned that it's subjective and you seem to focus on the evocative quality mm -hmm. of color. But do you mean then a purely evocative object, or is it also because I understand it to be a, to be a physical thing? Mm -hmm. I think it has to be um, balanced, physical, and um, like the so the mater the materiality and the immateriality of yeah. of the piece, and it's always. I mean, when you're composing, you have your two sides of one is trying to always improve your skill in learning the instruments and how you would compose and your techniques. And on the other side, you want to always feed your soul with with um, what you want to read. And um, yeah, personally, if I think of color, it would be the combination of two. Of course, it's difficult to describe it when I'm talking to another person or a colleague. And then I think it depends who I'm talking with, how I would describe it first. I would always describe it first with the technical aspect, I think. Um, but now I'm talking with you, and I think we all could, um, you know, go to a same same level of understanding of um, when I also talk about metaphors and. You mean it's 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 a combination. It's a it's um it's a technical device that you use. But at the same time, it's also what that tech, what those technical devices evoke. Um, is that what mm -hmm. you mean? Okay. But it's some maybe it's something that I would think about after I composed, like really reflect mm -hmm. about it after I worked on the piece. Mm -hmm. I I I wouldn't want to like compose now and okay this is. Uh, this is the bells of, mm -hmm. um, you know, it has to happen intu intuitively. <laughs> and you just, yeah, you just think about it after. But this is my problem, because now I'm doing my artistic research. And what you have to do in artistic research is you have to be aware of the whole process, and you have to document it. It's like the counter 
you know, counter process of what I usually do as composer. Yeah. And it's really a struggle. I always have to stop. Like I write something and I stop and write what I think about it and um, much more than how I used to. Mm -hmm. It's difficult because I think I need enough space from the piece to think about it. Yeah, I don't know um, how is it for 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 the others. Well, hearing that you're going through this process now, actually, it would be interesting to see how it would feed back into your compositional process. Looking forward to your future work. Yeah, I think it's also really just the metaphysical aspect of uh, the process itself, right? Where, where <laughs> we actually compose and build our vocabulary along with that. And uh, that kind of process is really just like very necessary. And it's like um, when you evoke certain symbols, I hear the sound of bells and this is my way of uh, kind of like evoking that. And there will be many, many ways of actually doing them. And it's very interesting to hear that when you do your research now, Feliz, it's like reversing the process, right? It's kind of reversing mm -hmm. that. But, but, mm -hmm. but many of us really just like deal with that metaphysical aspect of it anyways. Uh, by metaphysical aspect, uh, what exactly do you, are you referring to? In, in what sense? Um, I think it's really more just like on, you know, it's it's a more, it's an internal dialoguing, I would say. Oh, yeah. It's something that's not really like manifesting physically, but it's just thing at the background. Probably manifests itself later on. Uh, but mm -hmm. then, like, there's, there's the tension of like manifesting and not manifesting. It, it, it's like, it's, there's a veil hidden. I would say. So that's how I would describe the process in my own way. I think the notion of uh, color could be seen that metaphysical phenomenon. To me, color has not always been, if you talk of color in the context of the harmonic, Western harmonic, uh, let's use the word gestalt, the Western harmonic gestalt, then it refers to the notion of meaning which actually is attached to where this particular entity, a note, a pitch, a register, a sound of an instrument, a tamba, where, where is it located within that uh, whole universe of, uh, which is the gestalt, uh, the whole universe of, uh, of the harmonic structure, so to say. Mm -hmm. But with the annihilation of that, that gestalt, uh, we have even more, we find even more things. So, so I'm just, just to make it short, I'm, I, I'm, I was really fascinated uh, with the notion of color, not for the object itself, not for the sound itself, but what comes in between those sounds. Uh, I'm presently analyzing uh, Gegen und Endlich. Uh, have you heard of that piece? Uh, Spalinger, Gegen und Endlich, it's like a, to me, it's a basic treatise in composition, and and apparently, and, and the first part is are all drops of uh, of sound of of uh, of pitches, all of them in between each other and all that stuff, and and it's it's like a, it's going towards infinity, meaning that he was trying to show that he's isolating parts as he's trying to show that there is more to just what you hear. I mean, uh, just to make it short, I mean. I don't want to discuss the whole analysis here, but but, but that fascinated me because uh, because color was not really the object, but what comes in between the object from one object to another. That 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 was color to me. I don't know if I'm making sense now, but uh, and I, I still find I I find the same also in listening to to Felicians uh, Hibla when I listened to it last night. I said I think. I, I, I confirm this 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 uh, this uh, let's call it a sensation. Uh, if you like to call it a sensation in that sense, and uh, to give meaning to that, or or to invoke collective meaning uh, to that to that phenomenon is is also might be one of our uh, one of our goals as composers, as composers, as Filipinos, as, as Southeast Asians. 
I really find it very interesting to highlight that aspect of collective memory too, also just because like composers usually tend to individuate the process, right? It's like, this is my voice, this is my style and so on so forth. This is myself even uh, <laughs> as we talk about identity, but, but to invoke collective memory and use that process of color as a media intermediary, that's very, very, um, I think very significant. And I've, I'm not really sure if uh, that has been the goal of many composers, actually. And it's something worth thinking about, too. You actually see that in film. Uh, God give Mary certain visual, visual uh, stimuli. You have, it, 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 it brings to mind many memories. If you see something, uh, uh, films, which apparently give meaning that's visual the visual stimuli so uh uh sound stimuli could also invoke that and and we could use that that notion uh to be able to to address also a a population that is in a third world situation in the global political economy i'm not i'm not recruiting you for anyone kids but uh, I'm just suggesting such a notion so that at least we could even derive even more meaning to what we're doing, not just as composers, but, but as people, as human beings, as, as, as responding and, and to, to everyday lives of people. Yeah. I, I was walking this morning, I was walking this morning, this is a sidebar, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was, I took a walk this morning, uh, because it's a Saturday morning, and so I was walking in the community with all my mask and my gloves and all that stuff. And I see this uh, this family living in a what the you know cariton, yes. and of course my first response is I give a, I give uh, money to them so they could uh, buy some. So I, I gave money and then they were so, they were so happy the little child was happy and and, and uh, in in the minds of those people uh, uh, this COVID thing is no different from their everyday lives because because it's uh, it's uh, I mean the, how do you work from home if you live in a cariton right I mean in that sense so. I was so affected by by seeing that and 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 to see that and that that vision and and be reminded of oh man you're in the Philippines you're not in in Germany you're not in in Canada you're not you're in the Philippines <laughs> just because of that vision and it brings so much things to my mind just to see just that vision and and uh, before I left, I was so struck by the sound of the, the pingan. You know, they, they have these metal plates they used to eat, and, and bang! And, and I said, and that, that, that reminded me the sound of food for, for these people. I gave them like three or four 20 pesos. I just got out anything I had in my pocket. Kit, kit. Three or four twenty pesos, so pesos. I think I think they could buy some some rice. And I heard these sounds of tin cans and all that stuff. And uh, and and that came to mind. What what came to mind was uh, what was the meaning of the sounds of the, the tin can of, of cans when they were performing FMR by Schwalinger <laughs> in last year. I mean the, uh, things like those. And that to me is, 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 is the notion of color and collective memory in that sense, or collective, collective consciousness in that sense, not memory, but consciousness. So just for the sake of our viewers as well, when we say cariton in Filipino, it means um, they literally depict, uh, or they really refer to the wooden carts and the wagons that uh, many poor people actually subsist into and there are many of those scattered around the metro manila and in urban areas basically in the philippines and i would say that it extends the very idea it even transcends the idea of armory Schaeffer's um notion of soundscape because soundscape is like uh soundscape aspires to depict a certain world 
but but those kinds of uh, those kind of collective consciousness really like don't permeate into like hearing a sound recording of a soundscape to begin with so the field recording of of the urban street uh, in in manila like uh, does it really capture poverty to begin with does it capture uh, the aspirations and the feelings of people and i think this idea of color as being the intermediary of that really transcends this uh, this materiality i would say i've been looking at this page before the first measure of your score, there's a drawing. I'm reminded of the the many drawings that you have done ever since you were in uh, undergrad. Yeah. I'm interested because um, right away I imagined what the score looked like, and um, uh, you were you guys were talking about the, your notion of uh, color. And uh, actually, even if you didn't discuss your notion of color, this piece is colorful in itself, technically. And um, um, anyway, going back to this drawing, I imagine the orchestration first and uh, how clearly the, the piece is orchestrated and then how um, each sound was extended in another color so each color is constantly transforming. Uh, it's almost like, uh, I was thinking, it's almost like a, a postmodern crystallized Webern, you know, something like that. <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe you can give us some thoughts on this drawing because I can see numbers. I'm not sure what they, what they are. Do they even have any uh, connection to the the music or something? Oh yes, there are numbers, mm, right. So, um, that's right. I usually draw and I, I usually draw when I'm thinking, like I'm conceptualizing in the piece. So usually it's not necessarily about the piece, but I'm just trying to help my mind focus and um, while I'm thinking, my hand is moving, and I don't know what will come out. But um, maybe this drawing, it's one of the few where I actually, again, um, like think of, you know, um, visualize the structure of, of the piece and how I would look at the piece, because you see these are three connected photos of the same image, but just taken from different angles. Mm. It's called Hibla because Hibla means a uh, thread. I was thinking how, like how I would want to weave the thread. The numbers, they are, these are like groupings. I am composing groups as if they're one other object, but it's a combination of sounds of instruments. So in this way, I don't think any more of them as individual instruments, but as specific objects. Did you mean that those pictures correspond to the frames that are specified in your score? Frame one, frame two, and frame three? I, I was trying to look at that earlier, but I can't oh, yes, find the yes. frame four. <laughs> <laughs> there are only three frames. <laughs> yes, the frame one, you see, it's too short. I think the first frame is short. And the second frame is much longer and stretched. And the third one, a bit shorter than the second. It, it, it has um, connection with, I think, how I planned the time or the duration of the frames. My made the mistake of sending me your score and I've been reading through it. Oh, um, it's... First, I really, really, really like your <clears throat> accumulation from bar 62 to 70, the start of frame three especially your orchestration of bar 70. I really, really like that. I have to question though, does the 6-4 in bar 68, which is completely empty, add anything? It seems like a needless shift in the mental counting of the players. So this is a part of the phrase where musicians are really like counting together. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I 
I had to make specific duration for for how they would um, count even the silence. And it's it it the it's a different feeling when when you leave something on hold, and it will just be um, it will just depend on on who would give the cue, and then they always do something together. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, here it's just something specific. Mm, so it's structurally important to mm -hmm. count towards. Okay. Yeah, it's kinetic energy, right? As opposed to just like freezing in time. It's actually something that's deliberately moving. There's one thing that Boggs mentioned about, um, I think you said about uh, time. And I don't know if everyone is also um, thinking about, for example, the the space between pre precision and freedom, which I think I mentioned during Tata talk or AJ talk. Absolutely, I think that no? one of the things that we picked up that we all picked up from Jonas, possibly mm -hmm. from Aseda. And yeah, it's it's interesting how every one of us would find our way to, you know, adapt this technique mm -hmm. and until now i think i'm you know i i'm still finding my way but it's something that's very much more interesting something the, the, the thing in the uh, you know the blurry side of being so mm -hmm. precise and being too free yeah especially yeah. in europe yeah yeah, I would want to like ask that uh, or maybe just like uh, draw some discussions on that too because uh, to 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 look at the the vocal aspect of the of the music for example and one can say that the voice is really just like extending the body you know in uh, as a as, you know a sound production as a as as a mechanism of sound production. But here you actually see the tensions, as I've already mentioned a while ago, between imprecision and precision. And even as far probably as suggesting or like subtly uh, pushing in the notion of infinity uh, between certain points or, or just like a th seeing time as infinity in that, in that sense, where instead of being very discreet you, in the voice, you see glissandi uh, from high to low, and one can never really um, pinpoint these certain points. And that was the, actually the intention of highlighting them as opposed to having these uh, chromatic scales of descending quarter tones. Feliz, I don't know if you could actually like uh, talk more about that as well. And probably the rest of us can also like uh, think about it. So when I got this project, and it's about <laughs> microtones, right? And I knew that um, when you're composing for microtones, you would want to, or maybe in general, people would be interested to deal with the um, theories, like how you would um, work on harmonies based on the microtones. But I think my approach was really more on um, how it would adapt the sound that's already familiar to me. Yeah, so I just chose one simple gesture. When when you're talking and when you're finishing your line, you have this descending um, tone. The microtones is more of like, as you said, how it would stretch and how it you could find a bit more color when you're stretching the line. Because instead of just doing um, a slide from, you know, let's say, minor second apart, you can still play with these colors in between. Yeah, and this is probably what the uh, Zenakis might ha have not tapped on because like, especially when he was dealing with spirals and curves and, and works like a Nomos Gamma and uh, what was the other one? The, the circular orchestra, I totally forgot the name. Uh, Teratector, was it the Teratector? Yes, that was it, right? And, and I think uh, Zenakis was also kind of trying to deal with the tensions of having these limitations from these instruments, right? Of the orchestra instruments and producing these glissandi uh, mm. to depict uh, uh, his notion of curves and spirals. 
Uh, since we're into uh, uh, microtones, and apparently, uh, I'm just interested in the sociology of microtones because uh, uh, some musicians do not understand what microtones are, but they do it on a daily basis in their playing. Uh, of course, or in Europe, uh, it's highly developed the notion of microtones in France and all that stuff. Uh, but the notion of microtones in the Philippines, how, that, that's my question, how, how significant would that be to a country like the Philippines where playing is already microtonal in the first place? I mean, I know uh, it might be a cultural thing uh, and, and no, no, uh, uh, no bias, no offense, no, uh, it might be a cultural thing. I mean, if you, Listen to the uh, I was uh, the Marayao of the the Marayao of the uh, Iray Mangyan is, is Grisandi. It's 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 it's, it's, it's already lived uh, experience. I mean, this notion of microtones. We we speak of the significance of microtones because of the significance of equal temperament, right? I mean, that, that's why it's a phenomenon, right? I, mean. I would say, isn't it also kind of historical anyway, just also because in the development of instruments in, you know, in Western music uh, during the Baroque times, uh, like, like uh, there had been this uh, push towards a, uh, a consensus on temperament. And it's like, um, of course, in, in our part of the world, we never really had to deal with that because again, it's cultural. Um, and it's really funny to actually see that uh, Western music kind of like uh, it, it took a turn in that, right? Especially during the 20th century, where it's like suddenly, suddenly all these in betweens matter now. Unlike when before, when equal temperament was actually uh, became a standard. As, and and many people were also kind of against that, especially. <laughs> yeah, so I th that's what I, I have in mind for now when we talk about that. Maybe in my case, when, when I presented um, my idea for my research and they were all interested because um, with, with the voice and, and they wanted to, to know more about the, um, the melodies and the and the micro the microtonal aspect of the melody and and it's it's difficult to you know i'm resisting this very much of course and it's it's very difficult to to talk about it in because they have their expectations but the point is um for us this kind of of sound of it's it's something familiar and like what um, Tatai said it's you know it, it's not it's not like wow microtonal music it, it's it's not like this but um, f maybe here in in Europe it's something really um, people want to explore more. And it's connected to what Boggs has said. I want to to talk about like um, my impression when I first attended some fest, some concerts in Germany, and they were doing um, spatial uh, music uh, like theater, something theatrical piece for ensemble, and then they're situated in space, and they talk about this as if this is something new, and then I would think about um, this is really common in Philippines. And I don't want to do this, or I don't want. Um, this is not not so special. But here, it's like wow, you know. And it's interesting to know both sides. Uh, personally, yeah. I think that kind of thing will always be novel, if only because it's hard to mount. So it's the performances are still pretty rare, although the the repertoire for that kind of thing is actually pretty large. But um, yeah. Um, to that, I think there's a cultural difference on what 
which aspects of a piece have to be precise and where the music lies. Where here, um, there's this expectation that pitch has to be precise and rhythm has to be written precisely, although um, they get really upset when you say, no, you're not supposed to be able to do that. It's fine. <laughs> and they say, but I, I spent weeks trying to perfectly do this crazy rhythm that you wrote. And um, I think there is that, uh, where with us, I remember having long conversations about a piece of music where the pitch is not meant to be precise. And um, them saying, how can you then say that you wrote this music? I think there's still this predisposition towards music between being primarily melodic and harmonic. And when we say that this is music and the pitch doesn't matter, I don't give a fuck what the pitch is. The music will come out regardless. You don't understand that. I think that's a really a very good um, uh, take of point to actually articulate this uh, resistance, I would say. And for us, it's very important to even build a vocabulary in terms of resistance as well, because um, again, like uh, in our context in the Philippines, like we're living in, you know, in post-colonial times and all that. Um, so for me, it's very, very significant. And knowing the vocabulary or knowing or developing a certain vocabulary for that kind of expression of resistance is actually very nice. Mm -hmm. I would even argue that the use of voice in this aspect uh, in Philly's piece it's already like a precursor to that. Instead of uh, relying solely on the solely. idea of uh, discrete steps, we are actually transcending that and saying that this is also actually what we have. This is the soundscape that we actually lived in, right? So it's, a, mm. it's actually a cultural expression, I would say. What I, I always want to, to say whenever I encounter a European say, uh, talking to me about the kind of music we write here you know, from Maceda, etc. Is, is that uh, we have a different worldview, we have a different history, we have a different... Uh, so how significant was Vares in 1964? Perhaps it wasn't significant in, in Germany anymore, but in Manila it was, right? I mean, ionization, the first time Maceda performed it. Uh, it, it's always relative. I'm not saying that uh, this should be a, uh, because the danger of that kind of of, of uh, relativism is that uh, you can actually plot out who is advanced and who is not, right? I mean, uh, but it's, it's so, so different. And I was, I was doing research among the Raya Mangyan in 1983, my cigarettes from Marlboro and, and like it's so ordinary for me in Manila. But to them, it was some, something very different than Marlboro cigarette. So it, it had so much negative impact that I discarded the Mar Marlboro cigarette and I smoked whatever was available in the, in the village. Not because I find the village is backward, but because that was the the uh, reality of, of, of the people in, in, in the mountains of Mindoro. So the Marlboro was, was, was a disjuncture, actually. Just as uh, in the same way the Marlboro was a disjuncture, maybe the, uh, the gigantic, uh, what do you call those, uh, electric saws? When they, they, the, the, some of the children of the Rayamangan was telling me that this, they, 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 there was a group of people carrying gigantic monsters. And I said, what are monsters? Bahulao, uh, 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 they call. And when, I, when, when, when they showed me, when they described me, I couldn't understand what they were saying. But when, when I heard it, they were electric saws and they were cutting down trees. Do you understand that that kind of uh, notion? Uh, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I think I could I could relate that to the notion of uh, 
what is new and what is not new, but what is significant and what is not significant. I, 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 I don't believe that Europe is advanced in, in, in ways by which uh, it can tell us that, oh, your humanity is back. I, I don't think it is. I don't think our, our humanity is ever backward here. I have so many uh, experiences to say so. Only that the impact of, of uh, intrusion, that, that, is, that is the problem, the impact of intrusion. In, 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 in the 90s, uh, we did, the ironical thing is we had a project called Mindanao Highland Music, but the people were doing research on we're no longer living in the highlands. They were, they have uh, come down into the fringes of the city in the suburbs, living in small pocket communities. And uh, instead of being uh, farmers become wage laborers. Uh, there was a very good gong player. We were looking for him. And when we found him, he was selling cigarettes in the in a corner in Davao uh, del Sur. And so I mean, that, that's, that's what you call uh, rel relative listen, I don't know, modernity and all that stuff. Uh, I, it's so, I don't know where I went. It's, it's so far away. <laughs> you can edit out this thing. No, I think it's fine. Uh, we can also talk about the performative aspect of this piece, actually. I think we have a couple of questions coming in from Pauline and also from Mai in that order. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. The first one, um, I just wanted to ask the choice of vowels, because I was, because I also have a copy of the piece. I was looking at, at the first page and um, I, I was looking at the vowels, U, A, E, O. Um, are these vowels supposed to have, um, uh, um, um, are they supposed to be um, interpreted as a syntax of spoken language or as a syntax of color when it's sung? Because each vowel has a um, different format. So when you chose the vowels, or are they supposed to be um, a syntax of spoken language as, as it is, uh, e, uh, are they supposed to have um, a meaning such as a word or fragments of a word, or were they meant to be a syntax of color? First of all, um, when I was writing this, my right, my understanding for for the sound of the vowels, it's it's just starting or it's still developing. I mean, if I compare this from now, I, I use even more um, vowels mm -hmm. and I'm really conscious about its sound. So it's more of the syntax of color. Mm, okay, um, but if you notice I, I, um, in this piece, I just use uiayo and it's, yes. it's really something basic and <laughs> mm -hmm. um, definitely now it's, I know how, um, yeah, the color, how, what's the difference between the color of an A and an O and E and, and how, how it could affect also the sound of the instrument when you're combining it with that. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's, it's, it's an interesting aspect when it comes to the performance part of the piece. Because if, for example, you ask, um, Two different persons to play, to play that, to play that part, to play and sing that part, because um, there are different types of vowels. Um, I was just, I was just curious. What if um, an American musician would play it, and how would it sound if a Filipino musician would play it? In terms of the the existing notions, um, pre-existing notions of the vowel, um, the, the raw vowel pronunciation. Because for example, the, in the American alphabet, the A is an A and is pronounced A. And in the Filipino vocabula uh, alphabet, the A is more of an A, mm -hmm. a harder sound in, in simpler terms, a harder sound like A. 
I think it's an interesting aspect because when the performer performs it um, with the, with the with these um, vowel sounds in 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 their at the back of their heads, it's hard to speak in English. I'm so sorry. I'm translating my uh, my question. If um, if these specific musicians play uh, play this part, I think it would have a different color to the to the piece. It would add a diff I don't know if. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Well, actually, I try to use IPA so that even if they come from other countries, there's some um, like a, a common, a common um, like symbol for really what kind of sounds I need to use, even if I take it from a French, from a French text or, or German. Um, but I'm aware that like what you said, um it will still sound different because of the actual voice of the musician and this is what interests yeah. me a lot in my research now yeah yeah mm -hmm. I'm actually and surprised. also sorry oh, sorry no, no, sorry go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. okay um uh referring to what we were talking about uh as the voice as the extension of the uh of, of our human of our human bodies, the extension of the self. Um, the voice, uh, the sound from the voice already uh, came out, was already produced, and then it, it, it then again went through another medium and that's the flute. And I think that's interesting because it's like um, extending the voice, extending the inner self two times because it went through two med through two mediums and I think it's very, it's very interesting and that's why I'm really curious how how it would sound if different people different um, peoples from different nations or would would, would play this um, would play this uh, part this piece mm -hmm. so I think uh... We can also acknowledge the, that there's a certain history to this uh, talk about uh, the syntax in the vocal element too. Also, just because uh, knowing Philly's work from from many years ago, we were also like starting out with exploring vocal formats as well, right? So this is where the vowels u e i o actually came up, and you would argue that it's also very cultural as well because that's pretty much like how we can symbolize or we can concretize this way of sing uh, singing overtones. Right, mm -hmm. so we we call it overtone singing nowadays. Like you could even call it Mongolian Duvan singing and all that, mm -hmm. you know. But but this very idea of like trying to produce other colors coming from the voice. I'm quite familiar with Felice's current works because I've seen a lot of her current concerts, <laughs> and she has also shared with me a lot of her current pieces. And so it's interesting for me. So she's using. In this piece, in Tibla, all these vowels. Um, but then my question is, how does she then treat text? So how do you treat text? Does it affect the structure of your piece? Um, do the images and colors evoked by the words in the text also affect the color of the piece? Because I... I um, I've seen some of your, um, I forgot what was the title. I think something with room. <laughs> oh, so I see. A, a choral, a, uh, what's it, a choral piece? A vocal. quartet. Yeah. Yeah, quartet. vocal work. Um, and you are using their, I think, a French text. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm curious about it. <laughs> yeah, so by now I am, since I have expanded um, like the possibilities of voice, at least like let's let's just say I built my library on how I would use a voice, and um, I'm interested on both um, using the text only by its sound and using the text for its meaning, and using the text by both for 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 working on both. And for example, with Hibla, this is really um, more of the sound of, of the vowels. But um, 
for example, now with with my research, um, I did a trans I, I transcribed a very short excerpt of um, an epic song um, from Tiboli, and last year that was last year, and unfortunately, I don't have English translation of the text. So I was just listening to the recording and also trying to catch the syllables because what's written, the transcription of the Tiboli text is still different from what I hear. And that time I was trying to just transcribe how I hear it. So I would write it in the, uh, using IPA. And I learned a lot with how um, synth, how how the line. If if I'm going to to really follow and um, to really follow what the text, how the text was written, how I heard it would be totally different. Like it's um, how it's cut, how it's grouped, and how some syllables are repeated or some consonants are repeated. And so I'm really interested with looking at both sides text by this by its sound and text by by the meaning and i'm when i'm working now i'm working with um three ensembles and i really try to incorporate their voice especially that i know they come from different countries and and it would come naturally how they would speak for example the french or or with the german and how they would approach a text that is unfamiliar to them. Just a little comment on that, on your use of voice, Felisa. And I've, I've heard so many pieces from you that use the voice. I mean, instrument piece, instrumental pieces use the voice. And uh, I don't know how, 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 how you come up with those sounds, but... Uh, this is like a this is like a uh, a father talking to a daughter. The, the 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 sound of the sound the vocal sounds you use in your compositions or in your piece of, uh, actually remind me so much of you when you're angry when you're <laughs> I'm serious uh, when you're angry when you're disappointed when you're in Filipino that that's so feliz and when I heard when I, the first time I heard this. Uh, one of those, I think it was a flute solo piece. And, oh, that's so feliz. It's, 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 and it might come over to style. It's just that I, what, what I'm saying is that it's just, it not only extends the instrument, the instrument, the instrumentalist, the, the sound of the instrumentalist, it actually extends you. You, you are there. You, it's, it's, it's you actually was, was playing the instrument. It's you actually is is making those vocal sounds. It's just a comment because I've, I've heard countless pieces from you. So, so I'm not exaggerating, but a lot of pieces that, you, that, that make use of the voice as part of the, of the uh, palette of, of, mm. of the pieces. Yeah, um, I don't know if you remember last year during MCL, I played um, a vocal ensemble piece, but I didn't put this online. It's um, the piece, which is a study piece for an opera, for a chamber opera, and a lot of German texts. And I was really struggling with this piece because of the language and so on. Um, and after it was performed, I sent this recording to a friend um, and he told me that he, Feliz, you, it literally sounded like you. I, I imagine it's your voice doing this. <laughs> and maybe, hmm. well, it's really part of my composition process. I use my voice when <laughs> I'm writing the sound. And that's why I love working with um, mezzo-soprano. <laughs> because I feel that I'm working with myself or, or I, it's a sound very familiar to me. Coming back from this uh, talk about Cholera's process again, right? Like this is the result 
I see a certain result of it. And we, um, we see extensions of extensions of extensions. You, you can actually see that in the pieces, uh, treatment of the form or like treatment of time itself, right? It's always about extension. It's about extending this, extending that. The use of voice, the use of the instruments, it's a, they're pretty much extensions of selves. Um, um, even in terms of uh, the individuality of these instruments, like coming from from a collective uh, sound uh, body, like they, you see extensions of and extensions of these individ individual um, entities. And even more so when we talk about collective memory as well, we see again, extensions, extensions, being things being passed down um, to other people. And also like this, this kind of process is what fascinates me, even just like looking at this, the certain piece. And that's probably what I can say as a final comment to to this discussion on my end. All right, so that is a wrap for today's uh, edition of MCL Talks. I hope that uh, the next time we will actually uh, tune in again. So thanks for listening and uh, stay safe out there and please have a good day. Okay na tayo? Yes, yeah. Very good. <laughs> Where's my script? Kailan ko memorize mo? May script ko oh, pa. No, no, no. Pakibanggit no, no. okay. niya, Bogart, na hindi ako nakahiga. Nakaupo ako. Ang dami yung tatong sa kami, siguro mga tatlong tao. Nakahiga ba si Dr. Bas? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, pin-private message kami ng mga tao. Nagtatanong. Concern na mga sir. Bakit kailangan ba concern? Ano ang labo naman? Nakasandal ako sa mattress. Kasi ang sarap, oo. Oh. Grabe siya, ha? <laughs>